and welcome to Mariology. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the nature of devotion to Mary. And as we've come off lectures on Our Lady in the Old Testament, Our Lady in the New Testament, Mary in the early church, we want to show the development of devotion and, and the truth about Our Lady as it continues through the Council of Ephesus in 431, where Mary is solemnly proclaimed as the Mother of God. We'll discuss that as the first Marian dogma. And as it continues up into the early Middle Ages. But I want to begin by reading two historical accounts of the influence of Our Lady. These are both by world-class recognized historians, A, and B, neither are Catholic. So I want to begin with a brief reference to the famous British historian Kevin, uh, Kenneth Clark in his work Civilization, a well-documented uh, text on the nature of Western civilization in particular. And he describes Mary as follows. He says that she is, quote, the supreme protectress of civilization. She had taught a race of tough and ruthless barbarians the virtues of tenderness and compassion. The great cathedrals of the Middle Ages were her dwelling places on earth. In the Renaissance, while remaining queen of heaven, she became also the human mother in whom everyone could recognize qualities of warmth and love and approachability. The all-male religions a reference to Israel, Islam, and the Protestant North, have produced no religious imagery. In most cases, they have positively forbidden it. The religious art of the world is deeply involved in the female principle. So this is Kevin, uh, excuse me, Kenneth Clark talking about Our Lady as the protectress of civilization. That's not just of Christianity, but that's of Western culture in general. Now this is juxtaposed and complemented with the uh, writings of William Lecky, who is also a self-identified rationalist, uh, neither Catholic nor Christian. Uh, he will say regarding Our Lady's influence on Western culture the following, and I quote, The world is governed by its ideals, and seldom or never has there been one which has exercised a more salutary influence than the medieval concept of the virgin. For the first time, woman was elevated to her rightful position, and the sanctity of weakness was recognized as well as the sanctity of sorrow. No longer the slave nor toy of man, no longer associated with ideas of degradation and of sensuality, woman rose in the person of the Virgin Mother, into a new sphere, and became the object of a, revel, a reverential homage of which antiquity had no conception." So these are rather extraordinary testimonies to just classic secular historians on the influence on Our Lady. We could rightly say that second only to Jesus, and of course rightly so for a million and one reasons, Second only to Jesus, Mary not only becomes the mother of Christianity, the mother of the church, but really, as, as quoted, the protectress, protectress of Western civilization. That's how far reaching the influence of Our Lady uh, was and should continue to be in terms of Western civilization. And of course, there's new expressions of Our Lady's influence in Eastern civilization as well, certainly through Byzantine uh, Catholicism and, and, and uh, Orthodox Christianity. And now even in a rather fascinating way in terms of uh, not as a recent development, but perhaps a greater appreciation of even the role of Mary in Islam uh, with its obvious distinctions and, 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 and uh, differences as well. Well, I want to talk about the nature of Marian devotion. The, the early middle and even late Middle Ages are uh, packed. Uh, there's, there's ubiquitous references to Our Lady uh, in art, architecture. Uh, you see in these classic cathedrals, Our Lady is oftentimes the, the back centerpiece. 
what's the theology behind that? In fact, Dante would even go so far as to say, you know, someone seeking sanctity is like a bird without wings if they're not going to Our Lady. Pope Francis would say something rather similar uh, in our own time when he would say that a Christian without Mary is an orphan. That's a very strong statement. But this was the understanding, certainly, in the medieval church. But what about theological distinctions? And here, my friends, this is of, of quintessential importance because surely there are differences between the full Catholic understanding of Our Lady and a myriad of Protestant Christian understandings, uh, either from more low church, total rejection of any role of Mary other than just a physical channel of Jesus, uh, up to high church, uh, Protestant uh, church with, with Anglican uh, and Lutheran and other uh, elements where they're granting Our Lady's intercession, even as I mentioned to you in the previous uh, lectures about a book called Mary for Evangelicals written by two Protestant theologians, where they will say, don't deny Catholics the titles of co-redemptrix and mediatrix of Our Lady in, in virtue of the Annunciation. But so often there are misunderstandings about what the church really teaches about Our Lady. So it is time for distinctions. And when we talk about distinctions, we rightly go to St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and I want to go to this part of his classic work, the Summa the Theologiae. This is question one, oh, excuse me, 103, articles 3 and 4. And a quick, uh, for those less familiar, a quick uh, you know, a mention of, of the Summa. The Summa is the great summary of theology by St. Thomas Aquinas, written in the 13th century. Uh, for those uh, priests and religious and lay catechists, uh, the Summa won't be uh, something new to you. Uh, it is a classic treasure trove of theology and the proper distinctions. Now, in this question, so secunda secundi means the second part of the second part, Question 103, and these are the articles, Articles 3 and 4. St. Thomas is discussing, discussing the virtue of religion. And here St. Thomas uh, will distinguish between uh, two key terms. And these are good to know because this discussion comes back to us today. The first is what is called latria. And latria... St. Thomas defines as the manifestation and submission of excellence towards, uh, uh, shown towards the excellence of a uncreated person. So the manifestation of submission and the uh, recognition of the excellence of an uncreated person. That uncreated person is, of course, God. What's our common word? For latria, commonly, we would use the expression adoration. Okay? So, we adore God, and we adore only God, as dictated by the Ten Commandments and the precepts of the Church. Why does St. Thomas say that God deserves, and God alone deserves, latria? Or more commonly, we would use the expression adoration. Because of his absolute lordship because he is the master of the universe. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. And so what is appropriate to God alone? Well, the answer is sacrifice. We only offer sacrifice to God, and that's why in the proper Catholic concept of the Mass, Mass is only offered to God the Father. It's the sacrifice of Jesus, reenacted, continued, uh, through that great act of the Mass, through the mystery of the liturgical offering, the sacrifice. So God alone deserves latria. God alone deserves what we commonly call adoration. St. Thomas makes another distinction with the word dulia. Our common use of the word dulia would be veneration. Now, 
St. Thomas would define dulia as the reverence appropriate for the excellence of a created being. And his argument is simple, that created excellence also deserves recognition. And quite frankly, my friends, we do this all the time. They're called Olympic gold medals or uh, Nobel Peace Prizes uh, or getting uh, a, a key to a city of a, of a dignitary. St. Thomas is simply making the point that created excellence deserves respect and acknowledgement. Now, he will go further and say that with veneration, we properly venerate the saints and, as well, the angels. Why? Because they have excelled in love of God. And because they have excelled in love of God, God has given them the power to intercede within the body of Christ. And this is, as we talked about even in the early church, this is an accepted Christian truth and practice, the intercession of the saints and the intercession of the angels, which should call for our respect. Now, I have to make a critical a clarification here regarding the word worship. I'm going to put this over here, and I'll explain why in a moment. Okay, so worship. Now, worship has been used as a, gene a generic term which includes all forms of devotion in terms of religion. So, for example, we will see uh, in St. Thomas's uh, day, uh, and let me give you this reference too, just so you're aware of it. This is the Tares, question 25, article 5. Terrors meaning the third part of the Summa, right? St. Thomas will here ask, what's the appropriate level of devotion for the mother of God? And he's really, the question is, is phrased, does the mother of God deserve latria? And St. Thomas answers unequivocally, no, absolutely not. Only God deserves latria. So it's an important reference for people who want to know what the church really believes regarding Our Lady, that the church does not give latria or adoration to Mary. Now back to this word worship. So worship is a generic term. It was used even by St. John Damascene in the 8th century, also used by St. Thomas and uh, the theologians since then, as a generic catch-all term for devotion. Now why is this important? Because you will hear people say, do Catholics worship Mary? And here, my friends, we have to make a distinction because in the classic use of the word worship, you have worship A of Latria and worship B of Dulia. Worships is the big category. Both Latria and Dulia is in that big category. So that's why you have many authors from the 12th century on, once again, really even from earlier centuries, that will talk about the worship of Mary, but not latria, not adoration. So in other words, the cause of confusion today can often be when people say, well, Catholics don't worship Mary, and then they'll look at St. Louis de Montfort or even uh, a, a, a reference of the papal magisterium that will use that expression, but that's not referring to latria. It's not referring to adoration. Once again, historically, worship was the, the big category, and then you had to distinguish whether you meant latria or you meant dulia. Okay? And as we're going to see shortly, devotion to Our Lady has a special type of devotion, but it is clearly and infinitely less than Latria. So, in answering the question, do Catholics worship Mary, the proper answer is Catholics do not adore Mary, they do not give Latria to Mary, um, they give, as we're going to talk about, a form even beyond Dulia, which we call Hyperdulia, which I'll mention in just a moment. And so, therefore, technically you can say the expression worship of Mary, which has been used for a century, 
is a legitimate expression. Once again, it does not refer to Latria. So hopefully we're clear on that. I'm not encouraging on a pastoral level that it's a good idea to talk about the worship of Mary because of the confusion. Because for many, uh, to many Protestant Christian ears, that's the same as Latria. If you say uh, the Catholic Church worships Mary, they think it means the Catholic Church adores Mary. The Catholic Church absolutely positively does not. And that's again why I go back to the Terrors, question 25. Even back in the 13th century, this explosion of Marian devotion, it's very clear. St. Thomas says, we do not, you cannot give adoration uh, and, and uh, this, this Latria to Our Lady. I, I'm spending a lot of time with that because many, many Protestant Christians have the idea that, that Catholics do adore Mary. And, and so we really got to nail down the fact that by the church's own teaching, up, down, and sideways, it absolutely does not. Okay, now let's get to a third category that St. Thomas talks about in this question uh, 103 regarding devotion. St. Thomas says that the proper level of devotion for Our Lady is what is called hyperdulia. Now, hyperdulia may sound like a type of thyroid condition to you, but it's really a classic category of devotion. So St. Thomas says, and the church has made it her own, that the level of devotion appropriate for Our Lady differs in nature and degree from either Latria, of course, but also, and please note, from Dulia. That means even though we still venerate Mary, we should venerate her on a higher level and with a different type of veneration. It, it differs in nature and degree from dulia, from the general respect, the general veneration we give to the angels and saints. It is, once again, infinitely less than latria. So why does Mary deserve hyperdulia? What are theological reasons that can justify that beyond all angels and saints, you should have a love of Our Lady that transcends every other created being. Three key reasons. We could go through a long list, but I'm going to give you three key reasons of why Our Lady uniquely merits hyperdulia. And let me just say, by way of preface, my friends, we want to order our hearts based on the truth that the Church grants us. In other words, you might say, well, right now I have a greater devotion to St. Therese of Lisieux or to St. Michael the Archangel or St. Maximilian Kolbe. Those are beautiful devotions, and, and that, that's part of the richness of our family. But first in your heart, after Jesus, should come Mary, and, and this is why. So the first reason is that Mary alone has the fullness of grace. Briefly put, my friends, the saints excel in grace, as do the angels. Mary alone possesses a plenitude of grace. In fact, we could say that the, at the moment of Mary's immaculate conception that she possesses a quality of grace which far exceeds all other angels and saints united. Now, why isn't that just kind of a theological hyperbole? How can we say that? Because grace, my friends, is a quality of the soul in relationship with the Trinity. And so when we're talking about Our Ladies relationship with the Trinity, she is, again, the daughter of the Father. She's the mother of the Son. She's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. And that intimacy, based on the gift of her immaculate conception, transcends all other angels and saints united. Remember, grace isn't measured in buckets, right? It's not quantities. It's quality of the soul in intimacy with God. So first of all, Our Lady deserves hyperdulia, a, a, a higher form of both love, uh, devotion to her, even beyond the angels and saints, because of her fullness of grace. Number two, it is because Mary alone is the mother of God. Now, Suarez, the, uh, the post-Reformation theologian, the, the great Jesuit theologian, says that Mary alone, and I'll give the quote and explain it here, 
has an intrinsic relation to the hypostatic union. Now, what does that mean? It means that Mary alone is interiorly involved with God becoming man. The, the other two who come in, you know, second and third, would be perhaps the archangel Gabriel and Saint Joseph, um, or third and second, depending on your Josephite theology. But clearly, they don't have an intrinsic, an interior role in God becoming man. No, they're both proximate, they're, they're near, but they don't have an interior role. Only Mary gives flesh to the word made flesh. Sometimes, my friends, we get so used to that, we lose the awe. It should be pondered because in the proper sense of the word, it is an awesome reality that again, a creature gave birth to her creator and it didn't stop there. The union of the sacred heart of Jesus, uh, whose fleshy heart comes from the immaculate heart of Mary, even biologically, right? It's the blood that's pumped from the heart of Mary into her womb that, became, that becomes uh, an essential part of the process of forming the fleshy human heart of Jesus. So that is an, a, a, a transcendent reality almost beyond our comprehension of how united Mary would be to her divine son. And that's why you have many mystical writings talking about how Jesus can refuse Mary nothing. Now be clear, Mary's will was completely conformed to the will of Jesus in this life. She never even committed venial sin, as the Catechism of the Council of Trent will tell us. Well, do you think she's going to start sinning in heaven? Of course not. So there's no risk in saying that, uh, indeed, Jesus refuses Mary nothing because Our Lady only wants what is the will of Jesus, what is the will of Jesus and the Father and the Spirit. So she's the fullness of grace, number one. She's the mother of God, number two. Thirdly, she has a perfect obedience to the will of God. Now ponder this, my friends. How long is Mary on the earth? Well, we don't know for certain, but we can kind of estimate that if she gives birth to Jesus uh, approximately at 16 years old, and then for 33 years we have the life of Jesus, that brings Our Lady to somewhere around 49, and then uh, fathers of the church, and again, these are only speculations, and, and we don't want to take them beyond that, but the speculation is typically that Our Lady would have lived some other 8 to 12 years mothering the early church. During that time, as the Catechism of the Council of Trent makes clear, remember the Catechism of the Council of Trent is just as accurate as our Catechism is. Our Catechism is even more developed, but there's nothing wrong in the Catechism of Trent. Specifically says that Mary did not even commit venial sin. She didn't commit venial sin. After 60, approximately 60 years of living this life, can we understand, uh, can we really fathom what that means? Mary was free. Never take our freedom away from Our Lady because if you take away her freedom, you're going to be taking away her merit. You have to be free to merit. Mary freely chose to do the will of God at all times. Jean-Pierre de Cussade, in his famous spiritual work, Abandonment to Divine Providence, says that Mary's yes was the summation of all Christian spirituality of all times. Now, imagine this scene, my friends, and, and perhaps enter this uh, kind of theological meditation with me, if you will. I want you to think of the person that you love the most, whoever it would be. And if it's between two people, just choose one. Now, let's imagine, for the sake of example, that a, a group of soldiers come up and they start whipping your beloved. And after they whip your beloved almost to death, then they'll place a crown of thorns on your beloved's head. Now, you probably know where this is going, but, but bear with me and stay with me, if you will. And you're watching this. You're watching a crown of thorns being, being, being uh, pushed and pummeled on the head of your beloved. Then they this group of, of soldiers uh, put a 150 pound weight on your beloved and, and tell them they, they've got to walk up this hill and three times 
your beloved falls uh, and, and separates their nose and there's blood. I mean, of course there's going to be blood, you can imagine. Ultimately, they get to the top of a hill and they put nails in the hands and feet of the person you love most. And you, my friend, you can do nothing to stop it. Why? Because God has instructed you not to stop it, but to join in it in terms of the offering of the suffering of your beloved for sin. Well, ultimately, and now we understand we're talking about uh, uh, an analogy of what Mary's experience with Jesus. Ultimately, on the cross, after three hours, Jesus uh, gives himself to the Father. He says, consummatum est, it is finished. Before he does that, Jesus says to all present, behold your mother. At that moment, my friends, at that moment, Mary becomes spiritual mother of all humanity, which includes who? It includes the Romans, the soldiers. It includes the Jewish Pharisees who have been a causal effect on Jesus being killed and are still uh, arguably sending blasphemies and mockeries to Jesus. Mary becomes their mother at that moment. Mary begins interceding for them at that moment because she's the mother of all. Can you imagine enduring all that and not committing venial sin? That means, and let's go back to your example, let's say it's your beloved, the person you love the most humanly, right? You don't give a consent to any anger to them. You don't have an uncharitable thought about the people that are torturing and tormenting your beloved. In fact, you start praying for them, which is really a superhuman type of gift. So that's what Our Lady does. The Romans and the Jews, and of course all of us who participate by our sin, in the crucifixion of Jesus, Mary becomes mother. Mary becomes the instrument of grace and healing and salvation. That's why, my friends, that's why it's so important that we rightly give Mary the devotion of hyperdulia. Now, before we go, I want to give you one last reference from St. Thomas. So, this is Secunda, Secunde, question 82. And it's question 82, article 2. And it's where St. Thomas will say that devotion that you give to God's saints do not end with the saints themselves, but terminate in God himself. Now let me give you an example of what that means, and then we're going to apply it finally to Our Lady. Let's say you're at a art festival. And let's say the artists are present next to to their artworks. And let's say you walk up to an artwork, let's say it, it kind of moves your heart, and you say, my gosh, this is a beautiful work of art. And the artist who is sitting next to the artwork says, well, thank you very much. And then you retort in a strange way. You say, well, actually, I'm, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about the artwork. And then the artist kind of sheepishly, humbly says, well, actually, I am the artist. But let's say you respond, in an irrational way, saying, but I don't care. I'm talking about the artwork. Well, that would be illogical, right? That would be irrational, because if you compliment the artwork, you're necessarily complimenting the artist, right? My friends, Mary is God's masterpiece. Mary is God's quintessential artwork of all of creation except for the sacred humanity of Jesus, Mary is God the Father's created best. She is truly his immaculate, co-redemptive, maternal masterpiece. And so when you compliment Mary, you are complimenting the whole Trinity because indeed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in their divinity, in their perfection, are the creator of Our Lady. And that's why we have the maxim in the church to honor Mary is ultimately 
to glorify God. To honor Mary is ultimately to glorify God. Do not fear to praise the mother because it pleases the son and ultimately it glorifies the son. Thanks for being with us during this lecture of Mariology. This is Dr. Mark Mirabali saying God bless you all. And let's always remember the words of Jesus to behold our mother. God bless.